Good morning. Happy Sabbath. I hope you had a good week. Yeah, you had a good week. I want to welcome you to the Hillsboro Seventh-day Adventist Church. If it's your first time here, I want to welcome you to our church. Uh, I'm glad you've come and decided to worship us with this morning. And all of those who are worshiping with us at home, uh, I also want to welcome you. I hope that one day that uh, you'll be able to come and see the rest of us. But until that time, I hope you enjoy our, our broadcast over the web. Our Sabbath has come. We could rest from our worries. Amen. Uh, we could take a deep breath that God has given us another day that we come together and this joy, this time with God. And what a blessing it is. So this morning, we have a, a special blessing to you. Uh, we have our music here, our, our music service. And I just pray that the Lord will bless us in our service and may we glorify him this day. We just hope that you enjoy the Sabbath and uh, Pastor Victor will be preaching today. And I know that the God will bless us. For there is no other name under heaven given to men by which we must be saved. Let's sing uh, in Christ alone. Oh, 
Worthy is the Lamb to receive glory, honor, power, and strength. Um, let's sing, Lord, I lift your name on high. All blessings come from the, the Father of Lights. Let's uh, stand and sing, Come Thou Found.
Our church has been busy. We've been doing things and getting things and meeting and having a bunch of fun. And uh, one of the things that we've done is our church recap. So on our church recap, we have a couple of pictures that we want to show you. And we had two weeks ago, uh, Carla and Daniel, they're, um, they're, well, they're expecting really soon. And so we had a baby shower for them and um, it was a good turnout. People, friends, family turned out, and uh, I think Carla, uh, who is now a, a new member in our church, really appreciated uh, all of the support that she got. It was a good, it was a good time. And the second thing, we, the second picture we have is that we had a potluck out in the park. You know, um, the week before it said it was going to rain, so I called Anne or texted her, said, "You know what, Anne? I don't know if we could do this," but Anne's like, "No, it's okay." Just, we could have it anyway. And I'm like, okay. But she knew something that I always forget. Because when we have church events, for some reason, the, 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 I guess it's just the clouds just spread apart. And look, there's sun. Uh, he has a very, she has a very good connection. And so um, we had a really good um, fellowship and a meal out in the park. And it was nice to have. Do we have one more? And um, yes. And we have a prophecy seminar. For those who are curious, uh, we've started our prophecy seminar this week. Uh, we've had five messages, and uh, we're having a good time. Uh, I think that church members and people are coming, having a good time, and, and, and learning things. And then yesterday, the youth came out, and we had a presentation for them. And we've had a couple guests roll through, and uh, they seem to be enjoying it. Ronnie, like, enjoying it. And so, um, yeah. So if you want to come out, uh, we start again tonight. We'll have one meeting tonight, and then we'll start again on Monday. And we'll have another five presentations next week. So uh, it'll be something that uh, I think that will be a blessing to you. Well, one last thing we want to show you is that um, we want to encourage our church members to know what's going on outside the church in the web world. And one of the things that we want to show you is, is our Facebook page. How many know that we have a Facebook page? Yeah? Okay. So actually, to be honest with you, how many know we had two Facebook pages, okay? Uh, people don't know that. So if you, do, if you do a search for our Facebook, you'll see um, our, our church mirror window, and that, this, is our, this is our website, and this is where we'll put announcements and such of what's going on in church. So you can go to our Facebook, and Peggy and, and Zane are have volunteered to kind of update and keep things up there. Now, there's another... another um, I guess Facebook page, that's for us, our church members. And this is our Facebook family group page, okay? Now, if you do a search, you won't find this page, okay? Uh, this is a secret page, all right? Uh, we do that for privacy's sake because we have more of just our church members and privacy and whatnot. So if you're wanting to join our family group, our Hillsborough family group, what you do is send us an email to our church, and we could send you an invite, which you have to be invited to this page. If you search for it, you can't find it. So if you want to be part of this website here on this family group, um, just, let, well, just let me know. Say, Pastor Dan, I would like to go join this, and with this invite button, and we'll send you an invite to your email that you could enter this site, and this site will have more pictures of church members and what's going on, and uh, just, just, just group talk. You could as church members, uh, and you, and this is why we have it. So, um, yeah, enjoy our website, enjoy our family group, enjoy our Facebook, and um, stay involved, stay connected, and so you know what's going on in church. Good morning and happy Sabbath. This is the uh, time when we get the opportunity to work with the Lord through tithe and offering. And now our, uh, if you've noticed on your bulletin, offering emphasis is for the Oregon Conference Youth Support. And 
And if you're curious about what that is, take a tithe envelope and look inside, and it explains where our offering goes today. So uh, the deacons will stand, and we'll have a prayer. Gracious Father, again, we thank you for the privilege that we have to continue your work. Um, you have called for a tithe, and you've asked for a free will offering. And Father, we, we do both today. We, we contribute to your church, and we know, Lord, that you will bless it in multiple ways. And in Jesus' holy name we pray and thank you. Amen. Right. Happy Sabbath, everyone. All right, right now we're going to collect the lamb's offering. So all the kids. John, mission first. All right. Well, we're going to do something different today. And today, before Children's Story, we're going to have mission focus. And we're going to have a treasure hunt, which the kids are very excited for. Now, kids... You're gonna ha you have to find a treasure chest, but you have to do it quietly, okay? So look throughout the church quietly, 
and let's see who can find it. Yes? Right now? Go ahead. No, look first, and then I can give you hints. Well, it's not that type of chest. All right. Okay. Okay, you guys are cold. Warmer. Warmer. No, cold. Cold. Warmer, 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 hot, 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 hot. All right, bring it over here. All right, Tess and Lydia. Yes. All right, let's see what it is. Come on. It's a treasure chest. You want to open it? Open it. What's in it? A bike. A Bible. Can you show everyone? It's a Bible. Isn't that cool? No, there's nothing else. All right, now, okay, now you can sit down. We're going to talk about it a little bit. You can tell your mom. All right, so this week we have been talking about buried treasure in our um, children evangelistic series, and it's been really nice. And I just wanted to share with uh, all of you, um, it's been such a blessing. The songs, the program is fantastic, and we will be ending it tonight, but I just wanted to share this with you because we want to do this in the future, and we want to do it really good. But we need helpers for that because it, it's it's not complicated, but we just need help with it. And the kids have been having a lot of fun. We've been singing. Um, there's actual Bible studies, which that's the first one, the Bible guides. And um, yeah, so hopefully in the future we can finish and complete it. And the kids that come to everyone when we do it in the future, they get a Bible at the end, which is our treasure. Right, kids? We've been talking about that. That's our treasure. Yes. All right. You want to do it again? Maybe tonight we'll have another one. So if you come tonight, we'll have another treasure hunt. Yeah? Okay, good. All right, so now we're going to go into our children's story. And our children's story, we're going to talk about something that can only be viewed under a microscope. It's something super tiny, and it's called, you want to know what it's called? Laminin. Do you know what a laminin is? Okay, well, we're going to find out. So it says that laminin, pay attention, is a protein that is part of the extracellular matrix in humans and animals. What did I just say? That's pretty big words, right? Okay. So let me explain. Um, it says that laminin is a protein that lives in our cells, and it's the glue to our cells. It keeps our cells together. So basically, boys and girls, laminin keeps your body together. Do you want to see what laminin looks like? Do you want to see what it looks like? What does that look like? It looks like a thing combined with a Anthony, it looks like a cross, doesn't it? Isn't that cool that a tiny, tiny protein in your body that keeps your body together, boys and girls, is in shape of a cross? It is. Do you want to see what it actually looks like under the microscope? Let's see what it looks like. There it is. It's in shape of a cross. Now, I don't know about you, but I get goosebumps. It looks like it looks so gross. It kind of looks gross. Now, let's see what the Bible says. What does Colossians 1.17 says? It looks like it's I know. It says, by him, all things are held together. We've been studying this week in our buried treasure program. Yes. 
We've been studying about some health nuggets and some nature nuggets and nature gems. And guess what? God's fingerprint is all over nature and it's all over us. Guess what? Literally. God is holding us together. Isn't that beautiful? So now when you in science class and your teacher says, we're going to study lemon and you're going to be like, I know what that is. Yeah. All right. Why don't we bow our heads and let's have a word of prayer. Thank you, Jesus, so much. Thank you that you hold us together. Thank you for this week. Thank you for um, our church family. And Lord, be with us today as we worship you. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, boys and girls, you can go sit. preaching this sermon. This is not why I'm up here. However, I do have another message. So some of you who may not know me, my name is Gladys, and those of you who do know me, who I've built some amazing relationships here in this church, I'm proud to say that in two weeks, on November 7th, um, Chris, um, who is an elder in the Adventist church and a lay evangelist, and I are getting married. And I would be so honored if my church family were here to celebrate in the ceremony on November 7th at 1 p.m. here in the Hillsborough Church. Afterwards, Chris and I will be in the um, fellowship hall and we will share in some snacks with you for a little bit, but um, just open invitation. Join us. We'd be happy to, to have you. So thank you so much. This is the time when we come before the Lord's throne and we praise his name. And uh, at this time, I would like to invite those who are able to kneel and then we'll bow our heads and uh, present ourselves to the Lord. Gracious Father, once again, we want to praise you and thank you. Every Sabbath we say this, we, we are in awe. We just cannot believe. Well, as, as we spoke this morning in our Sabbath school class, the love that you show in spite of how wicked we have become, you have shown us so much love through long patience, and suffering and mercy that you show. Again, we praise you and thank you. And Jesus, that you are willing to come and die for us. The whole universe is looking, and they're just in awe. That I'm sure they're looking forward to when we, when we get to heaven. It's going to be an incredible reunion. Father, I know there are many here that are praising your name. Uh, you just heard Gladys, and Gladys and Chris will be married shortly. And we do want to praise you, Lord, for that experience. That is incredible that uh, two people would come together and, and share their love and show their love to their family. I know there are others out there, Lord, with praises and uh you know who they are, and uh, we would just want to acknowledge them and, uh, again, praise your name. Father, I know that there are others that are hurting, and um, we lift our hands again up to you, Lord, and register those issues that we have. Uh, many of us have, you know, health issues, uh, loss of family, Father, you know the pain, but again, 
you are so incredible. And again, we want to praise you and thank you. And Father, as we worship you this morning, we look forward to the message that you have given Victor. And we pray, Lord, that you will speak through him and that we will receive a rich blessing this morning. In Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen. Good morning, happy Sabbath. One more time. Good morning, happy Sabbath. I, every time I put this on, I realize how big my head is in comparison to Danny's. Because I have to adjust this thing about 15 times to be able to get it to, to snuggle right up against my, my, the back of my head. Um, how are you guys doing? Doing okay? Praise the Lord. It's a rainy day, and I moved here, and I love rainy days. I, I'm, a, I'm an odd person. I love a good rainy day, uh, and it's gorgeous. I wanted to just shout out everyone who's uh, helping in the evangelistic series. Uh, Danny and I I, 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 I can speak for Pastor Danny, and we are so proud to, to have so many people helping in, in everything that, that you guys are doing. It's, it's just an amazing work, and praise God for every single person and who's praying who's helping physically, who's helping spiritually. Just an amazing, amazing work. Let's turn to Revelation chapter 3. Revelation chapter 3. And we're going to be looking at verse 20. Revelation chapter 3, verse 20. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him and he with me. What an amazing verse. What an amazing invitation the Lord draws out for us. And we see in Revelation, almost every verse in the book of Revelation gleans something from the Old Testament. And this is no exception. This is, this is just a, a glimpse of a scene that when you really piece together, it is absolutely gorgeous. And that's what we're going to do here this morning. We're going to really unpack what it means when it says God is knocking at the door of our hearts. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much. Because we're about to unpack something absolutely beautiful, glorious, and amazing about who you are. Jesus this morning, we are ready. And so focus us in, dial us in, because we're ready for the rich blessings you have in store for us this morning. Lord, the, the, the words I speak aren't mine. The studies aren't mine. They're yours. So continue to lead us as we, as we have this wonderful message of how you're knocking on each one of our hearts. In your name we pray. Amen. Let's turn, of all places, to the Song of Solomon, chapter 5. The Song of Solomon, chapter 5. And I know that there isn't a lot of studies on the Song of Solomon, um, but it's a really intriguing book. Uh, Solomon wrote songs and poems, but this is the Song of Songs. This is the, the one that is, is, reaches his pinnacle, and it's of him and his first wife, Pharaoh's daughter. And it's just this beautiful combination of intimacy and romance and, and love. And it's, the, it's all about a love relationship between him and, his, and, his, and Pharaoh's daughter, his wife. But he writes it under two guises. He writes it under the beloved as the man and the Shulamite woman as the woman. And you have these two characters throughout this chapter and throughout this book. The beloved and the Shulamite woman. And people have wondered, why is this book in the Bible? And I know people who read the Bible cover to cover and specifically skip this book because of the content within it being a little bit uh, uh, spicy. Let's just put it that way. But there's two reasons why this, this book is, is in, the, in the Bible. And the first reason is that God is a hopeless romantic. Can I get an amen? amen? God is a hopeless romantic. Genesis chapter 2 verse 20 says, So Adam gave names to all cattle, to the birds of the air, and to every beast of the field. But for Adam there was not... 
found a helper comparable to him. So Adam is seeing all the pairs of the animals and he's seeing all of them interact and snuggle and cuddle and he's seeing all of this and he's going, where's my partner? Notice what God does here. And the Lord God said, it is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helper comparable to him. Isn't that cute? God is just, you know what, Adam can't be alone. Right? He can't just be by himself doing all this work. God is a hopeless romantic. I don't know if you've ever been a part of the third wheel. But basically a third wheel is you're, you're with a couple and you're by yourself and you're just the third person in this, in this group. And I was once a seventh wheel. There was three different couples and I was just by myself. And lo and behold, we were at a restaurant, and you couldn't imagine just how cute, and everybody was, and everyone was just cuddling and snuggling and, and smooching. It was this whole thing, and I'm just by myself at the restaurant alone, just like, okay, yeah, this is it. And, and that's how Adam's feeling. He's just feeling like the third wheel and all these, these creatures and whatnot. And God says, you know what, you, he can't be alone. The second reason, and, and the more important reason is because God in the Bible represents and puts himself as the husband and he has the church representative of a woman. Ephesians chapter 5, 22, notice this. For the husband is the head of the wife as also Christ is the head of the church and he is the savior of the body. Therefore, just as the church is subject to Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her. Notice the language here. That he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word. That he might present her to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. You see the language here. Church is being represented as a woman. Are you with me so far? So husbands ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself, for no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as the Lord does the church. So here Paul is, is, is using this, this interesting language to represent the church as a woman and, the, and Christ as the husband. And they're in this love relationship with one another. Notice what it says in 2 Corinthians chapter 11. For I am jealous for you and with godly jealousy. For I have betrothed you to one husband that I might present you as a chaste version to Christ. There it is again. Language, church, woman, man, Jesus, relationship, almost like a marriage. So when we get to Song of Solomon chapter 5, we have a woman and a man. The beloved, the Shulamite woman. And so the the second reason why this book is in the Bible is because it's a representation of church as the woman and Jesus as the beloved. Are you with me so far? And so as we put our illustration caps on, when we're reading the language from the woman, it's as if the church is speaking to Jesus and Jesus speaking to the church. And who makes up the church? us so who is who is the beloved really talking to who is jesus really talking to to us so that's the backdrop of this story so when we dive in and we read this language there's going to be three different levels there's going to be the level of the shulamite woman and the beloved the level of the church and jesus and the level of you and jesus are you with me so far chapter 5 verse 2 i sleep the woman says but my heart is awake. It is the voice of my beloved. You ever been there? Where you're asleep, but you're so excited you're not really asleep? Right? That's what she's feeling. I'm asleep, but, but I'm too excited. It's the voice of my beloved. She hears the voice. He knocks. The beloved knocks saying, open for me my sister, my love, my dove, my perfect one. Notice that language. I'll read it again for you. Open for me my sister, my love, my dove, my perfect one. You ever thought about how Jesus speaks about creatures 
the human creatures in heaven? You ever thought about how he talks to other beings about us? That's how he speaks about you and I. My dove, my love, my perfect one. Notice what it says in Ephesians chapter 2.10. For we are God's handiwork. Psalms 139, I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Song of Solomon chapter four, you are altogether beautiful. See, there's something gorgeous happening here. The beloved Jesus speaks about us the way he just spoke to the Shulamite woman. My sister, my love, my dove, my perfect one. To God, we are the most beautiful creatures in all of the universe. Take that in. We are, we are the most beautiful creatures to God, handmade products. You ever bought a handmade product? It's not the same, right? Something handmade and something manufactured is two totally different things. I have these boots, handmade leather boots, and I've had them for five or six years, and they are the best boots I've ever owned because they're handmade, and we're handmade, and, and God is so proud of his work. Can I get an Amen. My sister, my love, my dove, my perfect one. This is how God speaks about us. Notice what he says in verse two. For my head is covered with dew, my locks with the drops of the night. I just went camping for the first time uh, a week and some change ago. And I was in the tent and I'm sleeping and it's cold, but I'm sleeping And I sleep in a really weird position where I kind of push the pillow up against a wall or wherever I can. It's this weird thing that I do. But in the middle of the night, it's like 3 o'clock in the morning, I like to turn my pillow over. And I like to sleep on it because the way I sleep, then it's nice and, okay, fluffy and cold. I'm not going to get into it this morning. But I flip the, the, the pillow over, and it was completely soaked. And I'm like, this sucks. So I have to flip it over again. But that's the dew of the night, right? That was at three something, maybe 3.45 in the morning came the dew of the night. So notice the language here. For my head is covered with dew, my locks with the drops of the night. Not only was the beloved waiting there early in the morning, he was waiting so long that the dew was resting on him. Do you see that? See, when Jesus comes knocking at the door, He waits a long time. Are you with me this morning? Luke chapter 12, verse 40. Therefore, you also be ready for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. See, we think that's just prophetic. But that's all the time. Jesus is coming to knock at the door of your heart at any time. Think about the moment that you met Jesus or even heard. It came at the most random time in it when you least expected it and now that you're in this christian experience you're sitting here in this church god is knocking at your heart for something more and he's and he does it at the most random time and that's what he does here it's early in the morning he's been waiting for a long time the woman has uh, uh two choices here she has The one choice, choice A, which is to go to the door, open it, share this experience with the beloved, and have a wonderful time together. The second choice is to, you know what, let me go back to bed and just let it be. Let's find out what she does. Verse 3, I have taken off my robe. How can I put it on again? I have washed my feet. How can I defile them? What does she do? She chooses option C. She brings excuses. I've taken off my robe. How can I put it on again? I just washed my feet. I'm clean. How can I get dirty again? How many excuses do we put before the Lord when he's knocking at the door of our hearts? Oh, I can't, I can't, I can't eat. I can't, I can't stop eating pork. What, what am I going to eat? I can't stop watching that show. What am I going to watch? I can't eat healthy. But what am I going to eat? Right? Those are the excuses we put before the Lord when he knocks on the door of our hearts for more. I have taken off my robe. How can I put it on again? I have washed my feet. How can I defile them? 
You know what she was feeling in that moment? Comfortable. Comfort. She was, she was as comfortable as can be, snuggled up in her blanket. How can I get up and get cold and dirty again and open up the door for my beloved? How can I do that? How many excuses do we give the Lord when we're comfortable? God is calling us for more. He's knocking at the door, and, and, and some things are really uncomfortable to do. It's uncomfortable to give your time. It's uncomfortable to give your money. It's uncomfortable to give your resources. It's uncomfortable. But see, when God comes knocking at 345 in the morning, you have a choice. Let's continue to unpack. Amos chapter 6, verse 1. Woe to you who are in ease in Zion and trust in Mount Samaria, notable persons in the chief nation to whom the house of Israel comes. Woe to you who are at ease. Woe to you who are comfortable looking to coast in your Christian experience. Woe to you. It's, it's a scary place when you're just willing to just chill for a little bit. Now, there's a time and a place for that. But God is not, when he knocks, it's not about chilling. It's about answering the door. Can I get an amen? amen. Let's, let's, continue to, let's continue to unpack even further this imagery. My beloved put his, his hand by the latch of the door, and my heart yearned for him. Finally, I arose to open for my beloved. My hands dripped with myrrh, my fingers with liquid myrrh on the handles of the locks. Isn't that interesting? Before, it was excuses. Now, she's got to get ready and prepped and perfumed up to go meet the beloved. When all the beloved was asking, I don't care how dirty or how you smell, I just want to spend time with you. See, that's Jesus. He's not looking for us to get ready and prepped to open up the door. He just wants us to open up the door. Are you with me? So she gets all ready and prepped, and after some time, she's like, you know what? I'm going to go open up this door. Verse 6, and she opened up the door, and there they were, amazing in bliss, and they spent the rest of the morning and day spending time with one another. Amen. Is that how the verse goes? I opened for my beloved, but my beloved had turned away and was gone. My heart leaped up when he spoke. I sought him, but could not find him. I called him, but he gave me no answer. See, she waited. And not only that, she waited too long to open for her beloved. And now look, he's gone. And there's a prophetic message in there because there's going to come a time when we're waiting and waiting to open up for the Lord and we go to open up that door and he's no longer there. The question you have to ask yourself is how many opportunities have you missed simply because you were waiting? I was supposed to buy a ticket for someone um, so they could come here and um, he's young, he's... he's going through some things, and he's in Wisconsin, and, and the whole plan was to bring him here so he could see a new environment, eventually maybe want to come here, and so we looked for tickets for him, and, and it was 100 bucks, $99, one way from uh, Milwaukee to PDX. And I was like, oh, great, this is amazing. But it was like 8.30 at night, and I'm like, you know what, hon, I'm going to do this tomorrow morning. So tomorrow morning comes... I'm busy with the day, comes dinner time. Hey, did you get the ticket? No, 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 I got it tomorrow. I'm going to get it tomorrow. And the day comes, hey, did you get the ticket? Your wife get a little bit spicy with you <laughs> after the second day? Hey, did you get it now? No, 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 okay, one more day. I, okay, I, I'm, I pro, I'm going to go. I'm going I'm to get the ticket. So I finally log on after some more pushing on that third day. It, how about this? It felt like three days. <laughs> Was it two weeks, honey? Yeah. Okay, pray for me, everyone. Pray for me. <laughs> Put me in prayer. So two weeks pass. <laughs> I go to look for the ticket. It's three hundred and fifty dollars. Yeah. One way. Can't afford it. 
It was 200 bucks both ways, and now it's 350. I can't do it. All because I waited. How many opportunities are we missing simply because we're waiting? Amos chapter 8 says, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, that I will send a famine on the land, not a famine of bread, nor a thirst of water, but of hearing the words of the Lord. They shall wander from sea to sea and from north to east. They shall run to and fro, seeking the word of the Lord, but shall not find it. See, there's a time when we have to be opening up the, do the door for our Lord. And the time is now. Because there's going to be so many people who wait and wait and wait and wait and wait. And when it's time, the, no the Lord's not there. Probation has ended. And that's going to be unpacked further in our evangelistic series. But, but this, is, this is real. The, the, there's a time and opportunity to do, and it, the time is now to answer the call. Revelation chapter 22, he who is unjust, let him be unjust still. He who is filthy, let him be filthy still. He who is righteous, let him be righteous still. He who is holy, let him be holy still. Lord, if I could add a little bit more, he who is indecisive, let him be indecisive still. He who is hesitant, let him be hesitant to, still. See, there's going to come a time when whatever you are, you'll end up being forever. The watchmen who went about the city found me. They struck me. They wounded me. The keepers of the walls, they took my veil away from me. So she's out looking for the Lord now, looking for her beloved. And she's out and she's running around. And all of a sudden the watchmen come and she's vulnerable and they take advantage of her. See, the people who were supposed to protect her were the same ones who hurt her. How many of you have been there? The people who were supposed to protect you are the ones who hurt you the most. And how about this? The, the world that we grew up with, it, and with our wide eyes at eight years old and nine years old, and we grow up and, and we realize that all the world has been doing is taking advantage of us with their ideas, indoctrination, the take me society, the, the give me, give me, give me just been constantly taken advantage of. And we're coming into church, bringing some of this with us. But this is the healing place. We don't go to the hospital because we're, we're, we're clean and perfect. We come to the hospital because we're sick. And this is the place to heal from some of those wounds. But it's funny because she had an opportunity to open up the door on time. And when she didn't, the consequences were so painful. It took me 10 years to get here. I got the call to be a pastor at 19. And I went, and all the pain and all the things that I went through simply because I wasn't opening up the door on time. And now I've opened it. And praise God, he was there. But I'm giving you this as a woe. Be careful. I charge you, O daughters of Jerusalem, to find my beloved, that you tell him I am lovesick. What is your beloved, they reply, more than any other beloved? O fairest among women, what is your beloved more than any other beloved that you so charge us? Right? Describe this. What makes your beloved better than anybody else's beloved? My beloved is white and ruddy, chief among 10,000. His head is like the finest gold. His locks are wavy. His eyes are like dove. His cheeks are like a bed of spices. His hands are rods of gold. His legs are pillars of marble. His mouth is most sweet. Yes, he is altogether lovely. This is my beloved and this is my friend, O daughter, daughters of Jerusalem. That's the description she has of her beloved. Here's my question to you guys. When it's your turn to describe Jesus, how do you describe him? When someone asks you, hey, why do you go to church? What's your response? Why do you believe in Jesus? For real now. 
Moses was on this, on this train of thought, right? He was focused on the physical. She's, she describes him, the beloved, physically. And Moses was like, hey, listen, he says in chapter 33 of Exodus, please show me your glory. Show me your face. Show me, show me your physical attributes because that's what I want to see. But the Lord says, I will make my, all my goodness pass before you. And I will proclaim the name of the Lord before you. I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious. I will have compassion to whom I will have compassion. You cannot see my face, for no man shall see me and live. See, God is more worried about what you think of him emotionally, his character, than what, how you see him physically. It's more important what you think of God than what he does for you. See, we can't describe God physically. Jesus lived at a time we've no one has seen the Father except Jesus, but what we can do is describe him and who he is. So the next time that someone asks you, why do you go to church? Why do you believe in a Jesus? Your answer has to be because of his character. Because God is love. And he loves me so much that he would rather die than live one second without me in heaven. See, there's a hole in God's heart that only you can fill. And there's a hole in your heart that only God can fill. Think about that relationship with God. So the woman and the man, they find each other. They share moments together. There's only three chapters left in this book. And I suggest to you and your partner or you and someone special, take and read those three verses the, the, the man read the, the, the verses of, of the beloved and the woman read the verses of the Shulamite. You will find so much uh, intimacy and joy from reading those verses with your significant other. So I challenge you to do that on your Sabbath. But the story ends. They live happily ever after. But the story doesn't end for the church and Jesus. It ends for the Shulamite and the beloved, but it doesn't end for the church and Jesus. In fact, the story picks up in Revelation of all places. Revelation 12 says, now a great sign appeared in heaven and a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet and on her head a garland of 12 stars. Then being with child, she cried out in labor and in pain to give birth. And another sign appeared in heaven. Behold, a great fiery red dragon having seven heads and 10 horns and seven diadems on his head. His tail drew a third of the stars in heaven and drew them to earth. And the dragon stood before the woman who was ready to give birth to devour, devour her child as soon as it was born. She bore a male child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron, and her child was caught up to God and his throne. But the woman fled into the wilderness where she has a place prepared by God that they should feed her there 1,260 1, days. Now this imagery transfers to Revelation. We have a woman pregnant, right? Who's the woman representative of? The church. The church is pregnant with child. Who's the child? Jesus, right? She, she has the child, but the dragon is there wanting to devour the child. The child escapes. It goes up to heaven, but the woman is still there. And she goes into wilderness because the dragon is there. Notice this imagery now. There's a dragon and a damsel in distress. Notice the imagery we have, a, we have a love story that's the best love story of all time. A red fiery dragon and a woman caught in the wilderness. Now I saw heaven opened and behold a white horse and he who sat on him was called faithful and true and in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes were like a flame of fire and on his head were many crowns and he had a name written that no one knew except himself. He was clothed with a robe dipped in blood and his name is called the word of God. Amen. Prince Charming comes to save the woman and he comes riding on a white horse. What a picture perfect ending he comes to save her and you know what he does to the dragon he slays the dragon he destroys the dragon and there's no more dragon anywhere to be found it's just the beloved and his woman the church us
Let us be glad and rejoice and give him glory, says Revelation 19, for the marriage of the lamb has come and his wife has made herself ready. That's us. We're the wife. Notice what the Bible says. And to her it was granted to be arrayed in fine linen, clean and bright, for the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. That's a sermon for another day. How to prepare and get the wife ready for the second coming of Jesus. For Prince Charming. How do we prepare? And it says by the righteous acts of the faith, of, of the saints, because faith without works is what? Dead. So now we have he, the Prince Charming, Jesus, on a white horse, saving the day. We have a woman now, the, the, the dragon is slain. She's finally ready. She's prepared for, for, to have a marriage with the beloved. And, and they get married, right? We go to heaven. And it's funny because it's, it's not just the marriage that Jesus prepares for. He also has the honeymoon. Then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. So he not only has the, the saving act, the marriage act, he has the honeymoon act and prepared for us as well. See, that's the love story of heaven. See, he came and died for us once. Then he comes to take us home because there's a fiery red dragon out there wanting to devour us, wanting to take us out each and every day. And we're just a damsel in distress. But I promise you, for all those that are feeling down, downtrodden, depressed, sad, Prince Charming is coming. Amen. And he's coming to save us. And there will be no more dragon. And we're going to be up there with him in our honeymoon. And guess what? There's mansions. There just happens to be home for every single one of us. That's what awaits us in heaven. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, you are the beloved and we are the Shulamite woman. And you knock on the door of our hearts each and every day and you call us for more. God, let us respond with vigor. Let us respond with excitement because we know you have something in store for us. Father, all you want to do is dine with us. Spend time with us. Get to know us better. And we take that for granted. Let us answer the call as a church. Let us, let us have the righteous acts of the saints so that we can prepare for this wonderful wedding in heaven. Because there's a banquet. There's a honeymoon. There's a celebration to be had when we get there. Jesus, thank you for loving us with an undying, reckless love. Thank you, Lord. In your name we pray. Amen. Have a wonderful Sabbath. Remember this love story that you are a part of. Better than Titanic. Better than, I, I, I don't even know. Better than, than Romeo and Juliet. We are a part of something glorious and righteous in the name of Jesus. Happy Sabbath.